really grateful uh, for this evening to be able to talk to you guys because you're the holistic parents here. And um, who better for me to talk to than you guys? Because I'm sure you're going to incorporate something, some little golden nugget into the lives of yourselves or your family. And that's my whole purpose for being here is to help affect change out there in the world, especially with the children. So I call this presentation Eliminate Chronic Disease, which is pretty powerful, right? Imagine if we could eliminate chronic disease. Uh, but my favorite headline is really the, the sub-headline. The potential to heal future generations is in our hands. So everybody look at their hands. You know, it's it really the potential to heal future generations is in our hands. It really and truly is. And you'll kind of see by what I'm talking about in my presentation how we can all do that and how we can make a difference. There's a nice quote that goes along with it. A nation is only as healthy as its children. And I think if we uh, make a difference in our family, in ourselves, and in our communities, then we also affect the nation. Chronic disease. One in every four adults now have chronic disease. And I think out of those people, one in three have more than one. So it's becoming more and more uh, prevalent in our society. Children today, the chronic disease, starting in 1994 up to 2006, it doubled. The percentage of children that had a chronic disease doubled. Could you, you know, imagine that? You know, what's happening with the kids? Childhood cancer is the number one uh, reason for death among children, which is tragic. And uh, one in every 13 children have asthma, which can lead to more serious chronic diseases like COPD. There's a ton of you know, ADHD children and um, allergies. When I was growing up and I went to school, there was no table for peanut allergies. It just it didn't happen. So there's something going on in this world. And I think uh, what we're going to talk about tonight, we can all do something about it and, and hopefully change it for the future. Chronic diseases are long term. Once you get a chronic disease, typically you'll have it for the rest of your life, very long term, 20, 30, 40 years. And a lot of them they call incurable. There's not really a cure for them. They just give you a lot of medications and whatnot to ease your symptoms, but nothing ever truly get, goes away and gets better. So these include cancer, uh, lupus and Lyme's and arthritis, uh, Hashimoto's, on and on. I could fill up the whole page with chronic diseases. And right now I'm going to say chronic disease does not exist. How about that? Doesn't exist. Um, it's really, it's the medical community kind of putting names on things based upon where the symptoms are. They really truly don't exist in the way that we think that they do. So it's important to remember that. And they call, you know, autoimmune disease, the fact that your body is attacking itself. And I'm a very logical person. And, you know, if you hear it so many times, you don't even question it. But think of it, the autoimmune, your body is attacking itself. Your body is made to protect itself. It sounds more logical to me to say, okay, your thyroid gland may have a virus or some pathogen in it, and that's why you have these antibodies and things that are going into it to get to protect you from it or to protect the gland. Like that to me makes a lot more sense than the body's just attacking itself. It takes the responsibility away from the medical community and it puts it on the patient, like, which I don't think is, is right or fair. And chronic d disease in general is unfortunately profitable for the medical community. It's long term, right? It's 20, 30, 40 years of buying medications to ease your symptoms. And then they may get worse, or you may get multiple symptoms from being on medication. So then you have to have another medication on top of it. And then you have to go for tests to make sure your levels are where they should be. It's very lucrative. So why would they want to heal you? <laughs> Because there goes the profit margins. And so I'm going to take the word chronic disease and I'm going to throw it in the garbage can over there. So we've eliminated it. So there you go. It was all of, what, five, ten minutes? <laughs> That's how powerful we are. 
So now I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Janice Pizzonia and I'm a certified regenerative detoxification specialist, a wife and a mother of four beautiful children. Uh, they're age 23 to 18. So between my husband and my four kids, I have um, three sons and a girl. And in the middle, my two boys are twins. So I had three under the age of two. I'm grateful for them and they really have allowed me to grow, <laughs> as I'm sure all of you know with children, how they do that. Um, and I'm also uh, the youngest daughter of Donald and Anita Cosma, who are my parents. And I really have to give gratitude to them because of the way that they raised me. I really have the ability to uh, be curious about things in the world and seek truth. And I'm not afraid to learn about something and form my own opinion, whatever that may be. I question that, and I, I can. Um, and I think that, you know, I'm very grateful for them. I don't know how they did it, but they did. And I, I hope I've done that for my kids. And I have two pictures, me and my dad, when I was little here in, at the beach, and then also on my wedding day when he walked me down the aisle. And I have pictures of him because he's really the reason I'm here today. When I was five years old, we found out that he, was, uh, he had a hole in his heart and he was born with it. And that year when I was five, he had two surgeries. The first one, he had the, it caused a brain abscess. So he had brain surgery and he came home from the hospital. He was shaved. He had a metal plate in his head and he had white bandages. So I'm five and I was terrified. I'm like, oh my God, what happened? And then um, second surgery that same year, he had open heart surgery to stitch up the hole in his heart. And this was back in the 70s when they cut you from here to here and it was this big, ugly, red scar that I can picture to this day. And again, traumatized. Um, and I always felt like I needed to watch out for my dad, I think because of that. He listened to his doctor, to the T, he took his medications three times a day. If my mother didn't have him out there on the breakfast table, what are you trying to kill me? Where's my medicine? I have to take that. I'm going to die without it. So he, he was funny, you know, but he was loud. and uh, But he was very concerned with his health. He really was. And so religiously for 30 years, he took those medications. When he was 69 years old, um, he had retired down to Georgia. And he had to, he had a long driveway and he had to go out and get the mail. And he would go out to get the mail and come back and he would be totally out of breath. He would need to lay down. And he was just like, I, you know, I can't live like this. He, he wanted his retirement to be something that, you know, he could do whatever he wanted and go wherever he wanted and feel good. And he was out of breath. So he called his doctor and he said, listen, you know, I can't go to the mailbox and back, what can I do? And so they said, well, we can put a defibrillator in your heart and that may help to regulate it. He went into the uh, surgery, they put a defibrillator in his heart and um, everything went well. And while he was under the anesthesia from having a defibrillator installed, his kidneys had failed, basically. And they, they never came back online. They never came back and functioned like they should. And three days after he got the defibrillator, he passed away because of the kidney. The doctor said his kidneys and his liver looked like mush, you know, from the 30 years of prescription drugs that he religiously took every day, thinking that this is what's going to make me live a long life. I would ask myself, what, what could he have done? Like, what could he have done different? And I searched and I searched and I searched. And when I met this man, well, I met him first on YouTube. His name is Dr. Robert Morse. And I saw a video of his. And I was going to click right off. It's funny. And I just started watching. And I have to tell you, it just spoke to my heart. And I knew that it was truth. And it was the answer to what my dad went through and what a lot of people go through what everybody really goes through. Um, so I said, you know, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna take his class that he teaches. And he's got, he's got a million YouTube videos, so you can always, you know, watch him and listen. And I went down, he's, he's down in Florida, because my mother retired after my dad passed away, she went down to Florida. So she's like an hour away from where he is. So when I go to see her every July, and next July I'm gonna go down, I go and I see him and I have my little consult, so it's, it's just awesome. 
He's great. Um, I took two classes. He certified me as a regenerative detoxification specialist and also a clinical iridologist. So um, he's really, you know, came down and really gave me the answer that I was looking for. And in turn, I feel like, well, I'm a student of his, and then I'm also a being that's on a mission to take what I've learned and that has really helped me incorporate it into my life and to be an example. Like that's the most important thing is really for me to be an example for my kids and not really to tell them, but to show them uh, by what I do and how I do it. And then when I meditate, I always get this image of take from the universe and incorporate it in your soul and then share it out and give it out. And I watched a movie uh, last week and it was Finding Joe. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's about Joseph Campbell who describes the hero's journey. All of the great fables are based on this hero's journey where you go out into the world and you encounter uh, you know, obstacles and you overcome them. But to complete the circle, you need to go back to your own community or family and share it with them. And that's what I feel like I'm doing when I'm teaching is, is I'm, I've learned it, I've incorporated it, and now I have to share it. So, um, and it's through my dad, my dad, allowed me to do that. So it's very special. <laughs> so that's me. And then, so why is everybody sick? Why is everybody sick out there? Um, you know, maybe we're living longer. I don't know, but I'm pretty sure we're not living better. <laughs> um, you know, I, my, I've always said, since I was little, two things. I said, I'm going to have twins, which I did, and I'm going to live to 107, which I am. So, but I'm like, geez, you know, that's a really long time. I'm afraid I'm going to be in a nursing home. I'm not going to have the, I want the quality of life. You know, that's why I want to live to 107, because I have a lot to do. You know, I want to be able to do it. So I don't think, you know, we might be living longer, but I don't know if we have that quality. And the quality is what we need. So, and unfortunately, I think that our children, our children uh, are not going to have that life expectancy that we have. I think they're going to have a shorter life expectancy. Um, and it's really, really tragic to think that. Um, and this is, I think, the change from our generation to theirs is where we're going to, like, oh, my God, something needs to be done. So we need to all step up and do a little something, and, and we all can. We absolutely can. Um, imagine the children of today that get a chronic disease. It's going to last their lifetime. But they're getting it younger than we are. And imagine them, you know, 15, 20 years old, they're still in college. You know, how do they finish their education? How do they hold down a job and support their family with chronic disease and have a quality of life? And then think about their retirement. Are they going to have a nice retirement? You know, so we really have to think about all these things. Um, and it's really, the answer to all of it is really, it's an accumulation of toxins. Forget about everything else and all the names you hear out there. It's, it really comes down to an accumulation of toxins, not only from our lifestyle and our food and what's out there, but from our parents and from their parents and from all the generations that haven't detoxed them out of their body. We have them. And our children have them. And my, my grandmother was one of 15. And she, uh, they had 15 kids because they, were, they lived on a farm and they needed 15 helpers to help with all the chores that needed to be done. That's why they had so many kids. And they ate off the land and they worked on the land and they probably played and they had their shoes off and they were in the ground. And, you know, and how different is that from the life that we have today? It's very, very different. I take pic pictures of people's irises and I can look at them. And the 80 and the 90 year old people that I see, you can kind of tell that they're 80 or 90 because like this little haze gets over their eyes. But if you take that away and you look at the fibers of their eyes, and it's like a wheel and the spokes, and it's very straight and there's a lot of them. They're all close together. And that means like they have a very good health integrity, a very good constitution. And Unfortunately, when I see younger eyes, it's not like that. You know, they're not straight. You know, they're wavy, and 
It's kind of like a, a pair of jeans when you wear out the, the knees. It's kind of like you see all the, the strands through there, but you can see through. You can see the hole, there's a hole there. And it's kind of like that. So, you know, over and over again, that's what I see. Uh, and it's just, it makes sense that this, it's just an accumulation of toxins. Like I said, my, my grandmother, she grew up on a farm. They ate off the farm. And yeah, that's, you know, pesticides were introduced and they were using them, I'm sure, but not, not for too many years before that. So she didn't have a whole buildup of toxins, but she started to get them as, you know, they started to be introduced. But your body's pretty resilient. It says, okay, I can handle this and maintain everything else and maintain health. And she had like four or five sisters, I remember, that used to live in Huntington and Cold Spring Harbor. And two of them were like chain smokers until they were like 96. And just, you know, passed away in bed and never had lung cancer or anything else. I mean, they were hardy. They were really hardy. And then the next generation, which would be my parents, our parents' generation, you know, they, uh, they got some of those toxins from the, their, their parents. So what happens in, when you have a child, the mother, her lymph system, and we're going to talk about this a little bit, but her lymph system gets transferred to the child. So a child, a baby infant that's brand new, that was just born, doesn't have a 100% clean lymphatic system they have their mother's system at the time that she gave birth to them. So if the mother was ill at, or, you know, during the time or had issues, then the baby could have issues. It doesn't start off 100% clean and, and get dirty. And that's, I'm like, oh, you know, I never thought about that. I'm like, oh, gosh. So imagine as generations go, go on, if we don't get rid of these toxins by detoxifying ourselves, then they get passed on. And a lot of these toxins, your body just likes to hold on to them, especially the, the gnarly ones, because their body doesn't know what to do with it. This is a little dangerous. And it, it stores it away in fat cells and things, and it just kind of, when I get to it, I'll try to clean it up. So they stay in your body. And, and when you have children, they get passed down. So, so now we have my parents' generation who, yeah, they got older and they, yeah, cancer started. Their, their life became a little bit more toxic than the previous generation. And they had a lot more cars and they, they moved from the farm to a house and food came from all over and maybe wasn't as good quality. And then our generation is now here. And again, we have even worse food and we have even more toxins to deal with and we have the paint and the carpets, you know, every single thing you can imagine. So, and then we have children and okay, we're giving them our toxins from our lifestyle, our parents' toxins, our great grandparents' toxins, they, they're getting it all. And now they're at a stage where, okay, the body is like, okay, I can't handle, I can't handle all this, what am I gonna do? And that's why you see children getting sick at a younger age. That's why you see uh, reactions to vaccines and whatnot. And yeah, vaccines are poisonous and they're harmful and they shouldn't be done. But if a vaccine was given to my great-grandmother, she probably wouldn't have a reaction because she's not t totally filled with toxins. But give it to a, a brand new infant that has a lymphatic system that's totally struggling you're gonna get some kind of horrible reaction. And that's, I think, what we're seeing. So it's, yes, yeah, stop the vaccines, but also let's address the body and what's in the body and why it's reacting to so many things out in the world. And that's where we're gonna make a difference. So we all have the power to heal. You know, don't, don't forget that, like, oh, this, I have toxins from how many hundreds of years? I can't fight that. No, your body can, and it's really good at it. It's been doing a great job. It's just, we've been abusing it, really. You know, we have to help it out, but just a little bit, just a little bit, and, and it will take over, and it will help. So always, always know that we have the power to heal. And it's just us. I'm going to just very simply explain how the body works, and it's really all you need to know to understand and, and bring it into your life. And 
Everybody's body is composed of 100 trillion cells, ton of cells, and two fluids, if you break it down very simply, just, just to do that. Um, and think of the cells as like a brand new baby that just was born. And think of the two fluids as the parents. And think of your body as this, this family, okay? You have all, imagine two parents with 100 trillion babies, like, ah! Go crazy, right? Um, and it does a pretty good job. And the, uh, the one parent, the fluid, would be the blood, and the other parent would be the lymphatic fluid. So the blood is what I call like a super parent, really, really good. And, but they don't multitask. They only do their own jobs, and that's all. But the blood is really, really super good, and it goes and it delivers all the nutrition to the cells. So imagine a baby. You have to feed it, and you have to clean it, right? Those are the two major things that you have to do. It can't do itself. So the blood is going to go through really speedily fast through your body and it's going to give all the nutrition to all the cells and they're going to be happy and then it goes through again and um, they all get fed and they all get taken care of. And the lymphatic, lymphatic fluid um, is a little bit different. It doesn't go as fast as the blood. It's more like a slow meander through the cells and it picks up the waste as it goes along and it keeps going. And imagine you have a new baby at home and you don't change its diaper for a couple days. Imagine that. I mean, not only would it smell and be stinky, but the baby would be in pain, right? Because what happens? Their, their bottom would get all red. It gets red, it gets inflamed, it gets painful. Um, and that's what happens to your skin, which is just a bunch of cells, because that's what we're talking about, cells and two fluids, that are sitting in an acidic environment, in a, in waste. Waste is usually always acidic. And it gets red and inflamed and it starts to hurt. So as a good parent, you know, we're going to clean the baby and keep the baby healthy. And that's what the lymphatic system is supposed to do. Uh, but unfortunately, the lymphatic system is a little bit, um, depending on the chemistry within the body, um, it will do its job either better or worse. The blood pretty much for the most part stays the same pH because if you change the blood too much, within a couple minutes you'll die. So it has to. So it always stays at that 7.3, 7.4 pH. But the lymphatic system is made up of fats in order to collect all these toxins and it gets affected by the pH of the body. And if it's too acidic, what happens is that it, it kind of dehydrates, it dries out, it thickens, it won't move as easily. And it, it's supposed to take the waste away from the cell and keep going and bring it to the, the lymph nodes. And the lymph nodes where it gets broken down further and then hopefully eliminated from the body. And sometimes the lymph nodes themselves are full. And you see it in the eye. It's like a lymphatic rosary. It's like all these white spots around the eye. Um, and if your lymph nodes are filled and the lymph fluid can't get through, it's kind of like gridlock in the city at an intersection where nobody's moving. It's like, okay, where am I going to go? I can't go behind me. I can't go through. And it gets stuck. And that's that accumulation in your body. And if it's an acidic environment, things get hardened and stones form and cholesterol starts to build up. Basically, if you lack toxins, your body responds in one of three ways, either with a fat, a lipid, to cool it off, and that would be cholesterol buildup. Um, calcium, which would harden like a stone, you know, kidney stones and bone spurs and things like that, or edema, water, to cool it down. So the lymphatic system has a lot to deal with, and if it's not moving and getting that waste out from the cell, then the cell is gonna be sitting in waste, kind of like the baby's bottom. And if it, you don't eventually clean it up, the cell is gonna get damaged, and the cell could eventually die. And that's, that's the start of all disease. So let's get to the root cause, and let's just start cleaning it up. And you, your body will do that automatically. It's not that you have to know what to do. You just have to know how to get it in a good environment so it can start cleaning up. And you have to be a little patient with it. It's not going to happen overnight, but, uh, but it will happen. That your kidneys are that main elimination organ from the lymphatic system. So even if the lymphatic system is moving nicely and everything's getting away from the cell, 
If your kidneys are not getting rid of the waste that's given from the lymphatic system to exit the body, then it's still going to stay in your body and cause damage somewhere. So we always want to make sure that our kidneys are filtering. And um, that's why I was so excited about dry fasting. That's one of the ways that you can really get your kidneys to filter. As a graphic, I have this uh, diamond of health that I've created. If you break it up into two triangles, there's one on the top, which is how to achieve vibrant health. And then the one on the bottom is kind of falling into that sluggish health. And depending on what's going on in your body, you can see where you're headed or where you want to go. And the foundation of both of them is the, the green. It's the nutrition that you put into your body, and it's your lifestyle. It's definitely both. You know, you can't, a lot of people will eat a perfect, perfect diet, but then they have a horrible lifestyle, or their emotions are all over the place. Um, it's not going to work. You have to... Um, address all the issues. If, you, um, if you're not eating properly or you don't have the proper lifestyle, then your body's going to become acidic. And that's that accumulation of waste uh, from the toxins that we've had from previous generations. And when your body's acidic, then you're going to start to get accumulation because the lymphatic system is not going to move freely, you're going to get the, the cholesterol buildup, you're going to get the stone formation, um, edema, so you get all this accumulation, and when you get accumulation, then it just sits there on the cells, and your cells can be damaged and die, and that's degeneration, and we don't want to be there, but we can always go up the mountain, I call this triangle the mountain, and um, if we eat the proper foods and we live the proper lifestyle and we make it a point to do certain things and not do other things, then our body will be more alkaline. And that's where your body likes to be. It likes to be that 7.3, 7.4. You know, your body likes that homeostasis. It just likes, you know, to be in balance. It doesn't like to be too extreme one way or the other. A little range that it likes, then things work smoothly and things get removed from your body. And you really, you can't detoxify and get rid of all these years of toxins until you're alkaline. Your, your body just won't even pay attention to you because it's so concerned about keeping you healthy with what's going on in the world today. It's not gonna get to those from 10 years ago. But if you really spend a lot of time and keep your body alkaline, then it will eventually get to those toxins that are stored deep down inside. And um, that's when we're really going to make a difference because once we start to do that, then your body says, oh, I'm on top of these toxins. Now I can start to regenerate tissue. And that's where my dad would have been saved because even though he was born with a hole in his heart, um, he could, you know, your body constantly, the cells are, are created new over and over again. And I think every seven years or so, we have a whole new body. So imagine he could really heal himself and detoxify and eventually repair the scar tissue. After that, he could have changed his diet, got rid of the toxins, healed the scar tissue and whatnot, and eventually heal his heart and have a whole new, brand new heart. And that was his answer. Um, unfortunately, you know, he didn't live to see that, but um, I made it my mission to help other people, and especially the children, so that they don't have to go through anything like that. So I encourage you to hang it on your refrigerator and just say, okay, what am I eating, and where is that going to lead me to, or where am I? Am I acidic? Okay, then I need to work on the nutrition and the lifestyle to improve that. And so a little bit about what I do with clients, um, I do a personalized, like I call it holistic detox consultation, because I don't look at one thing, but so many things in my life have made a difference. And I know it's all of them together. I know it wasn't ever just one. Maybe you have varicose veins and you bruise easy and have herniations and things like that. Oh, I, then I'll know it's like a parathyroid issue that needs to be strengthened. We also look at emotions. Um, you know, at the root cause, I think, of a lot of disease is a repressed, suppressed emotion. And people store them in their bodies, and that's acidic to your body. <laughs> and that's one of the causes out there. 
you know, we store fear in our kidneys and anger in our liver and things like that. So even if a lot of people don't like to go there, um, but when you start to detox and when you start with food, your body's going to show you <laughs> and this is going to come up. And it's just part of the, tra the teaching that I do is that, okay, this is going to happen to you. When you start to detox and do this, you're going to see things from the past come up and be okay with it. You know, just let it come up and notice it and be okay and then it will be gone. Um, essential oils are great to use for emotions and things like that. But that happens when you, when you change your diet. And spirituality too. It's just the feelings you have about who you are and your place in the world affect your health. I mean, they really, really do. You know, just listen to what kids are saying, like the words that they're using teach them um, how to think about themselves in a positive way and how to love themselves and the reason why they're here. And it's, it's all, you know, that everybody's basically good. Everybody's really good. There's not evil people out there. Um, I think sometimes that quiet, just setting the example makes a big difference. So we can all do that. We really can in, in the smallest area of our life. And the tools that I use, uh, basically diet is number one. You know, it's always going to be what you should and shouldn't eat. So we always start with diet. Food is your medicine. That's always um, what I say. And then iridology is a tool that I use because it, it shows so much. It really does. And it's not that I can tell you that you have a certain disease. I can't. I mean, iridology doesn't show you that. But I can tell you there's a weakness in the cells of this area of your body, whether it's the arm or the leg or, you know, your kidney, your right kidney. Um, herbs, I think herbs are really necessary in today's world because our food, unfortunately, isn't of the quality that um, it needs to be to, to heal us the way that we are. Um, so the herbs are that, you know, kind of bulldozer. They really help to get things moving. They're great at cleaning and strengthening the cells along with food. And then lifestyle. Uh, you know, I teach people how to get rid of toxic stuff in their house um, and how to just think about, you know, their world and how to be happy, really, because that makes such a big difference with your health. So... Um, that, all that is part of, of what I do. So it's not one thing. It's, it's a lot of stuff together. And it's personalized based on what people want to do and what they don't want to do. Because some people are like, I can't. You know, don't even go there. I'm like, okay, you don't have to. <laughs> but eventually, sometimes we get there. And that's just your body's way of saying, you know, this has to be addressed if you want to clean up yourself. So the ch we can all make a change. And that's really the what I want to implore you guys to do, even if it's small, it doesn't have to be big, but we can all make a change. And if you're interested in feeling better, which I'm sure everybody is, I mean, who wouldn't be? If you're interested in um, making your kids healthier, which I'm sure you all would, um, and making your family healthier, then just take a little bit of the knowledge that you've learned or listen to it again or go watch Dr. Moore's video and learn a little bit more and just try it on yourself. And I know your husband will. <laughs> but try it on yourself and just feel what's going on and you'll learn so much just from trying little things on your body and the way that your body is speaking to you. So. You just have to be quiet and listen to your body and hear what it's saying. And set that example for your children and your family and your friends and your students or whatever they may be. And when you do that, I think uh, we can all make a big difference. And if one person is just, they're just doing dry fasting, that's all they're doing. And another person is just eating fruit and that's all they're doing. And another person is just meditating then, you know, we can all change the world by just doing our own little thing. If we start detoxing them now and helping them to get rid of these years and years of toxins, and then that child grows up and has a child, and her lymph system is now cleaner than it was when she was born, 
now she's got a child, they have a child that has, is healthier, basically, than she was when she was born. And that's where the momentum stops for pushing us into the sluggish pit of health and the chronic disease of today, and we stop and we turn around and we head in the other direction toward vibrant health. And that's, that's where it's going to start. We just have to clean up the kids, and when they have kids, we'll already be moving in the other direction. It's that simple. What do you, how do you define dry fasting, and how long do you recommend? Yeah, dry fasting is basically no food or water. Um, you can make it really uh, rugged and not shower and not brush your teeth. No water, because everything gets absorbed through your skin. Um, some people do that. I mean, I. I don't think you have to. I have seen miraculous results, and I have some pictures of my urine before and after dry fasting. And it was initially clear, which means it's not filtering, you're not getting the sediment out. And after I started regularly dry fasting, there's a whole bunch of sediment on the bottom. Between. How long would you do it? Um, I would start off real small. Like even if it's 12 hours, you know, when you, including the time that you sleep, no water or anything, and then push it a little further, and then do maybe 18 hours, and then maybe do 24 hours, maybe once a week. I like to do it once a week. The important thing with dry fasting is what you do before and what you do after. So I would do, if you're going to do a day of dry fasting, do at least the day before all fruit, nothing else but fruit, because that will really hydrate your body and it won't be a problem. And then the day after, again, break the fast with all fruit. Well, it's interesting because the Ramadan of Muslims fast from drinking as well as eating from sunrise to sunset, and it's kind of a joke that, like, the man thinks you're always like, why water? Why not water? Like, right? Perfect. <laughs> no, because when your body is not digesting, even if it's just something as simple as water, which it really doesn't have to digest, but when your body's not in the mode of digesting, then it says there's like a switch. It goes from digestion to cleaning. Let me clean out the body. And then the minute you put food in, it goes back. It's like, okay, I can't clean. It's like, it's like a maid that only has one, can't multitask. It can only do one or the other. So the minute you, even if it's one little piece of watermelon or one little grape, your body has to stop the cleaning, we have to digest this. And all energy goes towards that. But when you uh, extend your time without eating or drinking, you're like, oh, okay, we have some cleaning to do, let's go. And the longer you do it, then the more and the deeper it can get into that cleaning, and you see it come out through your kidneys. And that's when you're like, oh my gosh, urine should not be clear. Urine is a waste product. I mean, yes, yeah, some of the time it will be. I mean, I drink a lot of water and I eat a lot of fruit, and a lot of times it's totally clear. But you have 100 trillion cells that produce waste all day long. And that's not your food waste. That's not waste from anything else other than your, your cells doing their job. And they produce all this waste. Well, where is it going to come out? Well, it could come out a little bit of the colon and through your skin and your lungs and everything. But the majority of it is going to come out through your kidneys. And you can see it. If you let, if you urinate in a glass jar first thing in the morning, after all night, you know, not having anything and not eating, then your body's going to do a little cleanup. And um, first thing in the morning, you should see, if you hold it, I hold it up to the light. And if you can see through it, it's clear. So it probably doesn't have too much waste. But if you put it in the refrigerator and you cover it, you put it in the refrigerator and let it sit for 24 hours, then you'll be able to see if there really is any sediment because it, it goes to the bottom kind of like a snow globe and it all sits on the bottom. It's like this white powdery um, substance and if you shake it then it goes back to being cloudy and then it will settle again and that is the metabolic waste, the waste from the cells that got eliminated through your kidneys and that's important because if your body isn't doing that then it's accumulating in your body. Because I've done water fast before, so okay. what, why, why not the water? Like, what is the water doing? So what well, is the water I, I've water fasted and I've dry fast, mm -hmm. and that's when I was trying to get my kidneys to yeah. filter, because initially they weren't, and dry fasting is what made it work. And there's a lot of people who's had similar effects. The dry fasting, for some reason, really gets your body into that cleaning mode. Mm -hmm. Like the water, I guess, it somehow slows it down, even though it's just yeah. water, it doesn't really need to be broken down. Yeah. Is there like an upper limit on how much water you can drink? Or like my teenager, 
He was drinking more and more water, and he just kept getting more and more thirsty. He was peeing more, and it was like, I'm drinking like two, three gallons of water a day. I'm like, wow, that sounds like a lot. Yeah. So I put like a little bit of salt in his water, right? and um, it gradually stopped where he, he went back to drinking normal amounts of water. But I yeah. too much water. When I talk about detoxification, you really have to, in order to alkalize your body, you need to hydrate your body. And water doesn't always hydrate you. What hydrates you a lot better is fruit. Um, and fruit has all those minerals in it, or a is mineral that the water. Fruit that's what, like, like melons. Uh, Watermelon is super, yes, yeah, super for hydration. And melons are great for the kidneys. Um, a lot of times when people have kidney issues, I'll put them on a watermelon fast. Just eat watermelon for a couple of days. It's great to really hydrate and flush out the kidneys. Um, so those kind of things are going to be much better to hydrate your body than just drinking a lot of water. Like juicing celery, and you know that has a lot of salts in it, like mineral salts, very healthy salts for your body to help you hold on to the water. I would do that before I drink a ton of water. What about like a broth? Can you broth like vegetable or bone broth before and after? There's something about fruit, and I'm always going to come back to fruit because fruit is, it's hydrating, it's electrical, it's a higher vibration. It's like fruit is like the food for us. Like we're, we have the mind and the nervous system that, that needs that higher vibration. Food really feeds it. Like if you have a neurological issue like fruit, is where you go. Like the vegetables can't help you with that. Vegetables can build your body strong and give you a lot of nutrition, but the fruit is the electrical food and, and we're electrical beings. And something about fruit that really makes you feel alive. Like what you have the watermelon. Like I look at watermelon and I smile. If that was a bunch of celery sticks, I know celery is good for me, but it, it's not gonna make me smile. Like a big bowl of fruit when you sit down, like you feel, I, I feel it, I don't know, I feel happier. There's something with the fruit and, and our beings that were made for each other. Um, and that fruit is going to help you detoxify. Vegetables don't help you detoxify. Vegetables can't get you up here to regeneration. So they can give you vitamins and minerals and things like that, but they're not really going to flush out and cause toxins that have been sitting there for years to be released. Fruit is going to do that because that's going to hydrate, it's going to alkalize so that things can start to move. What would you recommend for somebody who has blood sugar issues or prone to candida? The candida and a lot of that is because we, you have to eat fruit by itself. Because when we mix fruit with vegetables or mix fruit, like a lot of people have fruit for dessert after they ate a dinner with carbohydrates, and that's all going to ferment, and that's going to create a lot of fungus and yeast and candida. So we need to eat fruit by itself. Even melons totally by themselves, not even with other fruit, because melons digest super fast. So eat a watermelon and just not a whole salad, you know, fruit salad with watermelon and strawberries and grapes and bananas and everything together. No, it's better to do like mono fruit eating. Like just have, one, I'll just have a whole, I'll cut a watermelon in half and I'll eat it with a spoon and that's my meal. That's what I'm going to eat. And this way your body absorbs it. It's like, okay, this is all just watermelon. This is pretty easy. I know what to do. It's not like there's a little bit of this and a little bit of that and your body gets confused. And some things need an acidic uh, environment to digest, like proteins would need acidic, like hydrochloric acid to break down, and other foods need more alkaline. So when you have them both, they kind of counteract each other. And that's where you get a lot of fermentation, you get a lot of putrefaction with, with foods, and that creates a lot of bugs and yeast. Candida is hard to get rid of, it really is. But I wouldn't not eat fruit because you have to kind of break down all the accumulation in your body that's also contributing to yeast growth. So you have to keep it for a while, but you, you stay with the fruit until it gets cleaned out, and then eventually the candida will lower. They're not gonna all go away, uh, but it will lower, and just make sure your food combining is, is proper so that doesn't cause an overgrowth.
So thank you so much for listening. I had an awesome time presenting to you guys, and I hope you got some kind of nugget that you can bring home and um, use. So thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yes.